Oh, nice Christmas. Remember the bell. Good. Welcome, everybody, to the Council of Fort Lauderdale Civic Association's May meetings. And uh, what are you looking at me for? Anyway, <laughs> I'm glad everybody's here. And all, as always, we're going to start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. It's right here. Those on Zoom, feel free to join. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay. Right. Here we go. The agenda will probably be perfect. Only see one on Zoom. No, no, there are several. Okay, oh, I see. We got the agenda. All right. Lucy was there. Okay. Jean Jacques was there. Okay, so JJ. we're going to move right along, as I always do. I don't uh, have lengthy introductions for our speakers because they will talk about themselves a little bit. As right now, do we know if this, uh, if Greg is on the break right now? Yeah, it is. Greg is on the break. I do see. Okay. Well, we're gonna. All right. Good evening. There he there is. He is. Okay, so we're gonna start with you first. All right. Our first. How's so, everyone? Uh, well, right. He's smiling. They're all saying they're happy. Out in the sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to start with you, Greg. First of all. I think that you know that in the in the room and many members of the council spoke on your behalf several months ago um, at a city uh, meeting. As I kind of remember, there were about thirty people that stood up, and I don't know how many letters were sent on your behalf. So you're very beloved by all of us, and I. I can say on my behalf, I, I thank you for you know helping me with whatever I had going on and um, getting back to me and actually telling me the truth oh, okay. about you know what was happening. So I do appreciate that, and I and I don't want to keep you too long, but I I do want to give you now. If you recall when you started in this position, I did give you something I dug out of my own awards closet because you know quite frankly. I still have it. Money to buy you a gift or anyone really. So, right. um, so what I did because you worked so diligently for us, you were our champion. So, thank you. I uh, yeah. and for me, I'm going to give you. A <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, actually won by my daughter. Don't anybody <laughs> tell me. <laughs> She has a lot of these. As a matter of fact, she has so many hanging on the wall in her room. And she doesn't live with us anymore. My husband actually called it the most expensive wallpaper you could ever have. But I will slap this on you probably next week when I see you in front of a lot yes. of other people. All right. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you so okay. much. I just I just want to say thank you so much um to you, Mary, for always being engaged. I think it's very important what you do because you make government and you build community. And I, again, I'm very grateful for being able to serve and for all those that came that day um, to speak uh, about my service. And that really um, sparked uh, a lot of motivation to keep you know, fighting hard and also to keep giving my best. And so thank you so much for recognizing me. I, I wanna say that um, I'm very proud of the team and the leadership team that um, Susan is leading now. And I'm very um, confident that they will continue the charge and that they will continue uh, delivering excellence. Um, so thank you so much. And I apologize, I could not be there. Um, right now, actually, at Broward Health and I took a break, um, you know, I'm with my family member, I took a break, I came to the parking lot. And, um, you know, I hope that 
I get to see you and perhaps I can come by next uh, Civic Association meeting and shake everyone's hand because you all meant a lot to me and we did together many great things. Okay, great. Yeah. And, uh, next meeting is after June 1st. If you could give that to... What's that? I, I can't remember. Is it June 11th? I can't remember. Something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. June first. I can come to the next meeting and I'd like uh, to June shake your hand if that's okay with you. I'd love it. Yeah, okay, right. June eleventh. I'll pa I'll pass by June eleventh. If you can give is is Anthony there? Yeah. Yes. yes, I'm right here. Yeah, if he if you could give that piece to him, I would greatly appreciate it. And that's two items that I get. I have another red ribbon that you gave me for an equestrian award. Um, I I hold that uh, dearly. So. <laughs> Uh, these are great awards, and um, certainly I value those. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Take care, everyone. We are FTL. All right. Yeah. Okay. And on that, I'm about to introduce Susan Grant, who many of you are familiar with who she is. She's the interim. I'll do it later. Interim city manager. And... um. She's graciously taken on that role, and she is right here. So, so you can grant yeah. me this week. Thank you for having me tonight, and I want to echo what everyone said here. Um, about Greg, I don't know that we'll ever find someone who cared as much about the city of Fort Lauderdale and worked as hard as he did. So, we were really enjoyed working with him. I'm pleased that he picked Anthony and I. Um, to be his assistants, and I'm um, humbled by the commission's um, selection of me to lead the organization for the next 10, 12, 14 <laughs> months, whatever it is. I guess technically, I think interim is probably a better title, but the charter, if there are any charter review people here, okay. the charter says acting. So that's what I am. Um, acting city manager. Um, so as Mary said, I've been with the city a while I started and I'll just tell you a little bit about me personally because I like to know everyone's you know story um so so we'll kind of go there um born in New York my family moved to Miami when I was seven years old um a University of Florida graduate if there are any gators out there um if you're not a gator I was uh, married to a Seminole for 36 and a half years <laughs> So we have that mixed marriage thing going on. Um, after college, I went to work in public accounting. And actually, my first job was with an accounting firm that was called Coopers and Librand at the time. It's PwC now. Um, and we were in what was the landmark bank building in downtown Fort Lauderdale. So I started my career um, right here in Fort Lauderdale. Um, but the lion's share of my career was spent at the city of Coral Springs, if anyone's ever heard about that. Yeah. Um, I spent 27 years there. So wow. I was their controller, their HR director, their finance director, Absolutely. and then seven years as the deputy city manager there. Um, I retired, but really didn't do well. I mean, I, I got bored. Mm -hmm. um, so um, <laughs> I came to work here in the city of Fort Lauderdale, started as our finance director, Greg picked Anthony and I to be um, assistant city managers. And then, yeah, last Tuesday, um, a new role, which I am super, super excited about. Um, we made some leadership changes from the get-go. So happy to announce Laura Reese as an acting assistant city manager. Yay! And I know many of you are very familiar with Ben Rogers, and he is sure. another acting city manager. Um, so we only had two previously, and Anthony and I will attest, there's plenty of work to go around. So I'm happy to be able to have three folks on, on our team um, supporting us. So um, with that, I, I don't, like I said, today was just an introduction, letting you know that I look forward to working with everyone. I know many of you from, from different things. Um, um, but just looking forward to that. And oh, um, when I did take the job here, by the way, we moved east. So we are Fort Lauderdale residents, um, which is, yeah, like, yeah, so three miles from work. Um, and, you know, after 30 years of living in Coral Springs, which was great, we're really enjoying being east. Um, and um, again, just look forward to working with everyone. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, and then Coral Rich. Coral Rich. Yeah, I, and I think we've talked about that. So walk down, I walked down 26th. Oh, yeah. You're like 
right there on Bayview, right? right? Yes. So we're neighbors. Here we go. Uh -huh. All right. Thanks. All right, Susan, thank you so much. Now go home and get some rest. No, I'm going to stick around for a little while, oh, but then okay. I'm going to go home and get some rest. Okay. okay. All right. Very good. Yes. Danielle, good morning to you. I'm not what? I'm not bored anymore. No, not bored anymore. Your best show. Nice to see you. I was appointed interim senior executive VP of Seminole Gaming and Hard Rock International. It's supposed to be temporary two years. <laughs> two years. Just so I mentioned that. So we're we're gonna bring the city manager recruitment process to the commission at the next meeting. So <laughs> again, we would like the council to be involved in that, just so you know. We would like some representation from the council. So yeah, and just real quick, because the commission is planning on having a, I don't know, advisory committee, screening committee. So that's one of the things we're going to be talking to them about next Tuesday, how many people they'd like and how they would like to make those selections. So, okay. um, and one solid suggestion is, you know, obviously to have folks from okay, neighborhood great. associations. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, without further ado, anybody, anybody, everybody else good? Does everybody understand what the STP and Vanessa and uh, Ted Shirley stands for? We were all the same no. 10 people. Yeah. What, what is it? Same, same 10 people. Same 10 people. <laughs> we did yeah. have you on our is list. Is there anybody in this room that doesn't understand what that means? Explain. You're about to have you. We were like, Mary's. the Mary's. other eight. Madam President, Mary's. explain. Mary's. Madam President, please explain it. Okay. So, same 10 people. Sometimes in my neighborhood, that could say SFP, same five people. Oh. It's Sorry. usually the same <laughs> 10 people attending all the meetings and doing, doing all the work oh. and, you know, knowing what's going on and, you know, sending it to everybody. And, uh, you know, so that's really what that's all about. And every area has those STPs. So that's my, did I explain that correctly? Yes, but we were... Greg had mentioned that our neighbor leadership academy class that we, Tad and I were in the same class, that we are two of the STPs. Yeah. So these are for Greg. Oh, nice. We are FTL. Yeah, oh, Mr. Nice. Oh, nice. Okay. nice. Very nice. Hey, I'm so, um, yeah. get ready to share. Here's Phil. Get ready to share. Is all we do now. <laughs> Anybody else comes in? I just want to share it right here. <laughs> yeah. And it's just the thing too, like how do we get more people involved? Because it's always the same ten yeah. people yeah. at all yeah. of the meetings. So, like, we need to increase. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, this is spoken by a young person. So, all you young people, you're also yeah. young. Like yeah. <laughs> Don't lose faith. She's the next 10 people. She's the NTP. Yeah, yeah there, uh, we there we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move on to City Hall Reimagined. I don't know how many of you have been to some of those meetings, but there's been four. Am I Five. correct? Yeah. Five. Okay. Correct. I actually recognize you now. I didn't recognize your name. And um, talking about it are going to be Laura Reese, Acting Assistant City Manager, and Cheryl Dickey. She's the CEO of the of Dickey Consulting, which ran all the meetings at time. If I understand correctly. So please come on up here. I will get out of the way. Oh, Susan, wait. Oh, I forgot to do one thing. Who do I get a ribbon to? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm going to see. 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 Tell us what you're doing, please. I'm getting a ribbon too. You do you highly deserve it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Champion. Yeah. And you guys, I'll get you one one day. <laughs> All right. So you guys want to come to the front of the camera? Thank you. So you get closer. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Marilyn Milano. I'm uh, the chairperson of the Infrastructure Task Force. With me here tonight is also James Lebrie, who's a member, and he can't speak because of sunshine. So he's probably chomping at the bit to say something, but he's holding it back. Yeah. And we're very happy to be here tonight. I asked Mary to be on the agenda. Um, we have just completed. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Don't get me too close to that ribbon. Oh. <laughs> 
We have just completed five public workshops um, on the Reimagining City Hall project. Um, in August, we were asked by the City Commission to take on this task as the Infrastructure Task Force. And we have done this for the Commission in several instances. We, we've held public workshops before on how do you want to spend your money on infrastructure and the water treatment plan. And so this was, you know, within our mission and we were happy to undertake this. And uh, one of the things we told the city right off the bat was, yes, this, we'd like to do this. This is, you know, really the right first step, but we needed, we needed support. We needed city staff and we needed support from a professional facilitator because we're a, an advisory board and we don't have any staff. So we're happy to do this, have to work with it to make it, to make it happen. But we really, really needed the assistance of the city staff and, and the consultant. And to Greg's uh, uh, benefit of Greg, he was right on it. Contract was done and signed in literally split time. I think it didn't take a month to get the consultants on board. And uh, that was good because now we started. We started in December of last year. And we've been holding meetings now. And we see some familiar faces, people who have come to those meetings. What we're going to show you tonight is the result of the public engagement process. This is the result of who came, what they said, what they told us they were interested in, and um, uh, who answered the surveys, came for the meetings, et cetera, et cetera. It's very, it's uh, there's math involved, so don't get, don't get upset. There's a little math involved. But what this is doing is it's informing the members of the infrastructure task force as we prepare our recommendations for the city commission. We are having another meeting to work on that on May 20th, we hold a special meeting to put all of this together. And we have another meeting on June 1st to finalize our recommendations. And then on June 4th, we are going to the commission with our recommendations. Now you would think that that's the end. That's really not the end. That's sort of the beginning. Yeah. This is the beginning to get everybody's juices flowing and thinking about what it is that a new city hall should be. The past is not prolonged. What you did in the old city hall is probably, not probably, it's definitely not what you're gonna be doing in the new city hall. And so we are hopeful that we, we get this process started and then we're going around, we're making presentations. We were at the DBA last week. We're going to another group of business uh, representatives. We're here tonight to talk with you all. And after we make our uh, recommendations, we're going to be uh, following through with the commission to continue this talk. Now we have a five-year time horizon on the new city. Okay, there's a placeholder in the city CIP, two hundred million dollars for a new city hall within the five-year CIP plan. So this is not going to happen tomorrow, but the sooner the better. And we all know, as we've been watching prices escalate and, and projects going over um, over budget because they take so long, sooner is better than later. So with that sort of background, I turn it over to Peggy Lopez, Aurora Reese, and Cheryl. Thank you, Marilyn. So I like the comment about the same time people because all of you have been at these workshops. So I feel like I'm a little bit reaching to the fire. I know a lot of you have been part of it. And thank you for being a part of the workshops. I believe Dennis wins the award for me to all of the workshops. <laughs> he was always like the first one there, a smiling face, you know, helping to set up the donuts, you know, all of the things. So, um, yeah, so thank you to everyone who's participated. I don't have a clicker, so I'm going to be telling Andre Swin to advance the slides. Um, we put together like a high level overview if you're interested in the presentation. Um, that's part of the fact. There's lots of slides. Here. So today we're just going to give, give you an overview of what we've done and what we heard back from the community and from employees. Um, how did we get here? I think everybody probably knows, but in April we had a big flood and it rendered City Hall um, damaged and we couldn't go back. So right now we have city staff in a lot of rented space, um, primarily downtown, but some in the northern part of the city as well. So we're renting space and trying to figure out what's next for a permanent so we were asked by the commission um, in coordination with ITF to hold some public workshops to figure out what the community wanted in the new city hall. It's probably the one time in our lifetime that we'll be able to do that. So we've had fun with the ITF in designing um, ways to get public input. And next slide, please. We, um, well, 
And we've done that in coordination with this group. So the infrastructure task force is the public advisory board that's been guiding the process for every public meeting we have. We have one or two sessions with the infrastructure task force. They're working with us to develop surveys that go out to the community. They're working to design what the facilitated session looks like. Vicki Consulting, they're our facilitators and public outreach contractor. Um, she, she's gonna say more later. She's really been involved in all of those meetings as well. And her and her team come in and do the facilitated sessions to make sure that they're appropriately engaging the public and getting that input. The American Institute of Architects um, has partnered with Dickey Consulting. That makes sure that we're getting the correct conceptual design elements. The students have been involved helping to facilitate some of the sessions. So we've really been appreciative of their participation as well. And from the city side, um, OMB, or Office of Management and Budget, got volunteered to be the <laughs> So um, it, it may seem like not the perfect fit, but it really was a good fit for our office to um, help to lead the effort. Um, so we partnered with everyone to kind of bring it together and partner with city staff to just you know, reserve the facility, you know, put together the surveys, administer them. So I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl, who will tell you a little bit about the public input portion. Then I'll talk to you about the employee engagement and we'll wrap up. All right. So very good. You. And they were superb. If we had not had them, I don't know what we would have done because we actually got engaged to really be a part of just hearing the public, trying to get the public to be engaged. So with the next slide, um, would like to just talk about the fact that there were five workshops. We started in December and tried to have them around the city in the different districts. Um, and so um, we had them, of course, we started uh, at the FAU downtown uh, in their School of Architecture uh, at their lab. And then we went on uh, to do the introductions and we'll go through each one of those. And then the space allocation was at the um, LE Lee, my uh, YMCA runs his trunk in that district, and the amenities was at Holiday Park, and, and finance was over at the Beach uh, Community Center, and then we went back to Holiday Park. So um, that's how we conducted them throughout the city. On the next slide, <laughs> you'll see what we actually talked about in the first workshop. We're really just trying to deal with the general concept. Um, the architects helped us, AIA helped us with getting some visions of different city halls, they were really international city halls as well as some in the United States, just to kind of visually see what people were doing uh, today with uh, city halls. So the things that we focused in on, or actually the residents uh, focused in on, was looking at an evolution of city hall designs. Um, we started, quite frankly, with the history of Fort Lauderdale's city hall that we got from the Historical Society. So we still have those boards and um, we gave a, a general concept of each year, um, what took place and how uh, City Hall actually evolved into the one that, of course, uh, got flooded. They talked about wanting to have common features, but with some modern styles and how uh, City Hall would be utilized. They wanted transparency, uh, which dealt with not just um, transparency on how it was being dealt with in terms of the new City Hall being built, but also um, light, um, airy, and uh, kind of uh, the new technology being involved with the new city hall, they wanted outdoor space. So that then people would feel welcome and uh, at the new city hall and, and actually be able to convene and be a part of um, city hall and just be around. Um, in, in the next slide, uh, we then started talking about space allocation. Of course, the main objective was to make sure that we, they wanted to make sure that the city staff was back together again. They wanted to see a, a centralized facility. As you well know, it's kind of disjointed as it is. And so we did hear from them that they wanted to make sure that the city officials and city staff were in a dedicated space. But they also wanted to make it convenient to the public. So they talked about uh, making sure that uh, with these multiple departments that the public would have access um, and then we talked about uh, flexible space. They wanted to make sure there was flexible space. They wanted to make sure advisory boards and uh, some of the uh, neighborhood groups could meet in City Hall. So they wanted to make sure we had several conference rooms so there wouldn't be any conflicts. Um, so they talked about that. And then considering the future, looking at new technology, uh, but also understanding that it may change in terms of how much space is needed for staff because of the new ways that people are working today. 
In the next slide, we moved on to amenities. So there were so many amenities. People were talking about so many different things. We did not try to uh, discourage people from saying what they wanted. So therefore, you're going to see a lot of things up here that may seem like, you know, different things. And how can we do all of this uh, with 200 million dollars? So that's what the, the city to do. But we, it was a listening session, and we didn't want people to not feel like they weren't being heard. So people looked at having a campus. They wanted to have a welcoming um, center, if you will. They wanted to look at even kiosks, but also have a person who would welcome people. They also talked about, you're going to see affordable housing. They wanted to see the blocks kind of merged as a city hall campus facility. They wanted to make sure that um, it was a community resource. So there was a lot of discussion about making sure that the history of Fort Lauderdale was put in the space so that when people came in, they would understand the history of Fort Lauderdale and it act as an exhibit space uh, as well. I know many of you all know that there were some pictures there, but they're talking about a larger area than that. Um, they also wanted to make sure it was a collaborative space. Some people were talking about businesses being in space, so you'll see that as well. Um, others were talking about a welcome center actually being in, in, in the space. And then they wanted to make sure it interfaced with the public. So you saw some issues around making sure, as I indicated before, kiosks, but also a person who would welcome individuals. And then um, to attract youth, there was a um, one session and one table was really focusing on the youth and making sure that they were learning their civic duty and to try to look at encouraging youth to understand that there is a civic duty and there are actually jobs available uh, in uh, city government, as well as what you can do, which is what all of you all do, quite frankly, volunteering your time to be a part of uh, civic associations. Uh, so wanted to uh, make sure that was taking place at a higher level than it's doing now. Uh, making it easily accessible, they talked about free parking. As you all know, of course, when you go downtown today, you do have to pay for parking. And so they were making that uh, something that they wanted to make sure was done and then a comfortable experience. So again, the welcoming, the uh, something that would be um, um, iconic as well. They went into issues around even transportation, transportation connected back to City Hall so that you could get to City Hall with the various transportation modes. In the next slide, we moved on to um, finance and procurement. Now that was really, I'm gonna tell you the city staff was excellent. They, no. <laughs> no. They were excellent in that procurement uh, discussion. They explained everything in detail, as well as in financing. Um, so it was a robust discussion. Uh, there was <laughs> there, there was a lot of discussion. Um, there were people who understood the uh, P3 concept. So that discussion took place at a couple of tables. But then also others wanted to make sure that local contractors were involved, meaning architects and, and contractors were um, involved here in this community and not just always looking on the outside for others. Um, they also wanted to talk, talk about making sure that it wasn't an issue of designing first and then having a contractor coming in to do that kind of uh, construction because they understood that sometimes uh, the contractor will make changes and it's of course higher costs when that happens because there wasn't that a synergy between the design of the architect and the contractor. So with that said, they wanted to be a hybrid procurement where they would look at a progressive design build and uh, look at a hybrid procurement process. So they did talk about that. And then on the financing side, making it real clear that they wanted to have revenue generating as well as grants uh, and not just have the city have to pay for everything through bonds. So that was a discussion as well. In the next workshop, which was a summary, oh, well, we'll, we'll do the summary after the employee feedback. And did we just miss one? No, no, she's going to do um, the summary. Oh, at the end. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. So um, we also want to make sure we got input from employees. So we did that in two ways. We developed a pretty lengthy survey in partnership with the ACM, the <clears throat> city manager, and directors to make sure we're asking the questions that we need to know. So 132 people completed surveys, um, 132 employees. So that was a pretty good turnout. 
And then we had a town hall where we presented the results of the survey and had some facilitated discussions at smaller groups. And, and so next slide, please. Um, the results really were that employees really would like it to continue to be downtown. Same thing we heard from the community. So everyone agrees it should be downtown. Um, most employees felt pretty safe at the prior city hall, but safety was a concern for them as we designed a new city hall. Um, one of the things they really stated is they wanted separate space for the employees versus the public coming in so that that could be separated a little bit better than what we had at the prior city hall. And um, more conference space. Everybody said more conference. So um, those were the three key takeaways um, from the city staff next time. Um, one other thing that came out of the town hall was that we have an employee wellness center. They really would like for that to also be part of the part of the new city hall. Um, and next slide. So the last thing I'll share with you is the community survey feedback. Um, a lot of the data that Cheryl's just talked about is not really scientifically valid. We went out to the community. We asked people to opt into these surveys. But the city conducts an ongoing survey using Zen City using um, statistically valid methods. So we do have one question we can share with you from that survey. Um, we asked those who were selected for the survey, what would you find most important in the new city hall? And the top answer was just ease of accessibility and convenience um, and having good hours. So all of the responses, well, the majority of the responses were about making it accessible to the public. So there were other, you know, higher responses for parking, customer service, and some people said there was a need for a new facility. So, um, next slide, please. So I'll turn it back over to Cheryl to talk about the last wrap up. So in the last wrap up, um, we needed to do some things which which um, Marilyn called heat lab. Uh, which was really trying to get people to think through what their top <laughs> priority was. So we had them actually deal with, um, we gave them one red dot and nine yellow dots. And yeah. so the yellows they could put anywhere, but the reds we wanted them to concentrate on what was most important to them. So what you'll see on this is, um, uh, and I'm going to talk about it based on the workshop themselves. So the first workshop, as I indicated, was really about overall design. And so from the public, the first three were architectural significance. Uh, people wanted affordable housing. You've heard me talk about that whole campus look and then natural lighting. The other is really from uh, city staff uh, in blue and then um, the actual <laughs> surveys themselves that people answered on a monthly basis, access to parking and transportation. And uh, security really did come out as well in the public's conversation, but that's all part of what the city staff also said. Uh, in space allocation, as we indicated, um, really wanted to have the city official staff have dedicated space. Um, so that came out on top. And then the community should have flexible space that came out on top. So those are the two first, uh, the first two um, um, pieces of information are really from the public listening sessions. The next is from the city staff of flexible conference rooms and multiple space, even though at the actual listening sessions, they wanted that as well. And then uh, central location to meet with elected officials came from the survey that again was up monthly during the same time that uh, we had these workshops. Amenities, um, what rose to the top for the public in the listening sessions would make the location easily accessible and a community resource. Um, and then of course um, came the survey information that was in green. Um, people talk about nonprofit and community meeting space. And then, of course, um, creating the campus, as I indicated, and interface with the public. And then again, um, the city staff uh, talked about a gym, cafe, child care, employee wellness center. And when we got to financing, what rose to the top was the mixed financing that we talked about before with the federal grants, the bonds, and revenue generating um, piece there to help with uh, financing. And again, the high procurement approach is what people wanted to see. And uh, we sort of called it the three peach. I think, I think. And uh, again, uh, with the survey, maintain ownership of the land. That that did come out in people's conversation, uh, whether it was the lesson session or also the survey, that clearly they wanted the city to maintain ownership of the building and the land. 
And so again, when it came to costs, they wanted to make sure it was a balanced cost and not just all on the city. So that's that was the wrap up workshop information that we did. I think that that um, our next steps will come from there. Yeah. Which okay, thank you. So just to sum up, um, the infrastructure task force meetings are open to the public. Uh, as a matter of fact, our last several infrastructure task force meetings, we've actually had, you know, 125, 150 views. So people have been paying attention, but not a lot of people have been paying attention. This is not like the same 10 people. This is like the same 50 people, which is not bad, but it's certainly not statistically significant. We are very hopeful that once people realize the city hall is actually coming down, once they see it's, it's gone, and once we make these recommendations and we have meetings uh, with the city commission, we'd probably be re recommending to them that we now go into a, a more public meeting scene, scenario with them, perhaps a workshop with them or a conference meeting. Once we get this material out onto the street, I think we will generate a lot more enthusiasm and excitement and perhaps more insights, although this is pretty comprehensive from the same 50 people who are you know, into this kind of stuff. So again, if you want to watch or actually view the infrastructure task force meetings on May 20th and June, uh, June 3rd, uh, you just go to the city's website, type in infrastructure task force, it takes you right to the webpage and you, it tells you, you know, how to click on the links. You can watch it in real time or you can watch it at your leisure on YouTube. Well, we're on YouTube, can't believe it. So, but that's your two next opportunities to see how this process is going. And then if you want to, I think uh, you might think about coming to the June 4th meeting of the city commission where we will actually be talking about this and we'll be talking about next steps. And the next steps have, you know, uh, the, this is a commission driven uh, process. We have done our job on June 4th, we will have done our job and we will be uh, making some recommendations through the commission. And then we'll have feedback from us. What do we do next? How are we gonna get more public input? How are we getting more business input? We need a lot more input from the business community as well. So again, those are your three opportunities, June, May, May 20th, June 3rd, and June 4th. And we hope you will take advantage of those opportunities. And sure, you have a copy of the wonderful booklet. Oh, it's yes, going to be yes. available. It's on the website. It's on the website. Oh, all, all the information is there. As a matter of fact, kudos. I must take this opportunity to thank the staff and the consultants. They did a yeoman's job in terms of outreach. I mean, when I got the fourth email to remind people to come to the uh, uh, Reimagining City Hall, even I was a little annoyed you know, four <laughs> times than I got. But, you know, we did everything we could, including social media and, and everything we could. And, and still, we got a lot of information out, but we didn't get a lot of input in. So we're hoping that that will be more generative and, you know, the, and and people will get more involved in this as it becomes more of reality. You know, that's how it works. You know, unless there's an issue on the table that's, you know, has immediate impacts, people just don't think about it, don't get involved because we all have lives to live. But this was a very good start and we're, we hope that you will now participate more and then we'll get even more uh, we'll get an even better product. Yeah. Thank you. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to ask. Oh. Uh, let me get Barbie and then you, Richard. Yes, thank you, Marilyn, and thank you very much for. Thank questions. you. Yes, great. <laughs> okay, I have two questions. First question is um, under financing, it said revenue yes. generated. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what. What is that talking about? Is it talking about renting space from F City Hall, or is it talking about some other method to generate revenue? Well, I don't know that many people know this, but the first City Hall was uh, in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce actually and the City Hall were in the same building. So the thought was, okay, well, maybe there are some not-for-profits or business organizations that, that would benefit from being close to the city and maybe we would have a building that was big enough to accommodate that. That was one of the thoughts. Uh, and as, as Cheryl said, we did not discourage anybody from thinking outside of the box. So it's there, it's a suggestion. And uh, it's a lot of support for it because I'll tell you what was the most 
one of the most interesting things was people did not want to spend a lot of money on the city hall. <laughs> I mean, no, we, we have a lot of problems in the city. We, you know, we, every time you have a meeting, everybody wants affordable housing. Well, you, you talk about the water plant that people talk about affordable housing. Those are heartfelt, you know, uh, concerns that people have. So we, we, we let the discussion go wherever the discussion went. And that was, hope I answered your question. Okay, and then my other question is, you said that the presentation was on the website. Are we talking about the Fort Lauderdale website? Or are we talking about the council website? No, the Fort, the Fort Lauderdale has a dedicated website, web page, dedicated. Only to reimagine City Hall. <laughs> you just go to the web page, type in reimagine City Hall, it takes you right there. And right on our website, the council's website, the there's link. a link there. Is the link. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Um, yes, I wanted to know if uh, anything was discussed about having the building lead certified, and I'm using that. Yes. yes. Yes, that always comes up. And I wonder if we have. Um, some developers in our town that we've been very generous to would like to give back some of that. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> I think it should be proposed. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'm just curious the affordable housing component that is mentioned in there. Is that would that be something that would be possibly open for some city staff or people like that that would have a certain level of income that want to move their life in further? There was two, two two thoughts on that. And again, this was generated from a free flowing ideas, okay? Affordable housing, period, because everybody is, it's a crisis and everybody, but then they focus, some people then focus on, well, well it's not affordable housing for everybody, I mean, not everybody wants to live in this city wall, right? <laughs> but staff might want it, it might be a but, synergy between them. So that's doing for a short that, period of time, that's that's come up. That's okay. it, come okay. up, okay. yes. Okay. Right. Thank Thank you very much, everybody. Thank we'll you. Be back. <laughs> Um, okay, really, I really appreciate it. I think two of these meetings, I don't know if any of you had a chance to go and get you guys to And um, it's, it's really interesting to try to think what an office scenario for the employees would be like in five years. And, you know, I remember what uh, it was like to go to work in the office when I first started back in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> But um, it's radically different than it is now. And I went and visited my son, my daughter and her husband, my son-in-law's office in LA. He works um, for Apple TV. And you walk in the office, they all no, they all have those things on. <laughs> and they're like this. Oh no! <laughs> and, you know, and they're walking around and oh, they're getting their drink. I don't know how they do it. They, I could just does anybody talk? No, we do this. <laughs> so I mean, it was interesting. I don't know how long that's going to last, but you never know. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, five years from now, I should still be alive. Well, I <laughs> hope so. Okay. Now, um, next we're going to talk about the Charter Revision Board. Um, we have Harrison Grand Williams, who sat on. The board now for what I don't know, at least a good year and a half, a something like that. Half, something like that. Yeah. And Anthony, they're gonna um, talk about the changes. And Junia, yeah, we couldn't do it without Junia, that's for sure. And uh, Jim and I have gone to, I think, the majority of the meetings. So we have a good sense of how much work great right, Jim go into these meetings. But before we do that, I cannot forget our police, which I already forgot once, so I don't want to do forget again. They just want to say hello. You guys are charging for that's five minutes. Thanks. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sergeant Rich uh, with the District One Community Support Unit. I know you guys got a lot going on today, so we'll be brief. Um, but we just wanted to come in and say thank you. A couple months ago, we came in and talked to you about our tender tops that were coming up, which were fundraising events for the Law Enforcement Torch Run, which raises money for this couple of years. Not only did we have those events, they were successful in all different areas of the city. We raised a good amount of money. Uh, we had the run up A1A uh, last month. And I'm happy to say that for when you include all law enforcement agencies in the state for sheriff's office and PDs and everything, we raised the fourth most. So we did a great job there. Money, potential Olympics, it was a great event. So I just wanted to thank everybody that participated and all the community involvement that we had. Um, other than that, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, the PD did just do a changeover with all of our email addresses. Um, essentially, they should be the same, except it should say flpd.gov. And for the community support, Units for each of you to contact us. 
Um, I'm going to send our new email addresses to Mary, and that will get you your district captain, your sergeant of your specific uh, community support unit, and the officers on that unit. So for all of your concerns that you're having in your community, it'll be a real easy way for you to share that with us so we can start working on it. Uh, other than that, uh, we're coming up into, we got done with spring break, and we're kind of in the middle of the year before we get uh, the holidays. So the second and third quarters are really time for us as the community support unit when we're not getting torn in a million directions, the school being out for us to help out. So please let us know anything we can do, big projects that we can help with, just let us know. And we're more than willing to uh, assist and be a part of that. And as such, um, again, we're doing our best and trying to have new ways to engage the community. Um, Everybody involved, young, old, whoever wants to come out and hang out with us and do things, we're involved too. So uh, we would like to ask you and the members of your associations as well, if you have any ideas, um, we're open to them. Contact us, let us know if there's something you got. If you want to uh, play uh, golf kids in Oswald Park, you want us to come along, you want to go surfing, you want to do some art downtown with chalk or something like that, whatever it is you want to do. And if you have people in your community that are willing to do it, uh, please let us know. Um, we're always just open for new ideas and new things to do. So that's kind of one of the things we're pushing. Other than that, I know you guys are busy, so uh, we'll keep it brief. But we just want to come in and say thank you to everybody. And uh, uh, yeah. I wanted to mention this National Police Week. Where we honor our police officers, and we also remember those in Fort Lauderdale gave their all in service to the community and across the nation. So thank you for thank your you. service to thank our you. city. There you go. Okay, they are the best. They are the best. Be safe. Be safe. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now on to uh, our charter revision board. So go ahead. Uh, take the floor and let me say that right. Hi, I'm Harrison Graham Williams. I'm Steve Glassman's uh, appointee to the charter revision board. Uh, I have been on it for about a year and a half, uh, so much so that my term actually expires next month. So the next meeting is actually going to be my last meeting with the Charter Revision Board, but good news, you're gonna be in good hands. Uh, Steve was kind enough to appoint Michael Alvetta. Oh, great. District two on Charter oh. Revision Board. Uh, it's a five member board consisting of myself, uh, Richard Weiss, uh, who's uh, one of the main partners of Weiss Sirota, um, Jacqueline Scott, who I know is on the on Zoom with us, Vice Chair uh, Chris Ferdig, and Chair Judith Stern. And we have basically started off looking at a series of 14 sections of the charter. The charter is a tidy little document that basically fits snugly in a three inch binder. Um, and from those 14 sections, there were a couple of areas of cleanup and outdated language that we wanted to address. And before I start talking about these 14 sections, I want to talk about two things that we discussed at length, but did not come up with recommendations to give over to uh, the commission. The first one was almost every single member of the Charter Revision Board was of the opinion that while it's a great thing that we moved our elections to November, it would be great if we had a primary or runoff. Oh, yeah. And then we ran headfirst into the buzzsaw that is the special act that covers all of Broward's municipal elections, where we were basically told by the attorney to the supervisor of elections office, um, you've got two options. You can either have your elections in November or in March. If you'd like to have primaries, they can only be in March. If you would like to not have primaries and have them in November, they can be in November. And we said, well, what about a runoff? And we were told no. What about like, having a general in August and having to run off in November? No. And in spite of the fact that, again, there, there really was some general consensus that there should be some tweak to what we currently have, there really was this uh, lesser of two evils sort of understanding that it's better to have the turnout that you get in a November cycle than to try and have everything moved back to primaries in January and general elections in March with you know 10 to 13% turnout. Um, the other thing that we talked about but did not come up with a recommendation to give to the commission was form of government. Uh, as we know, city of Fort Lauderdale has a commission manager form of government. 
where the commission is the policy making body and the city manager or the city manager is the executive. We do have locally in both Plantation and West Palm Beach, what are called strong mayor forms of government, which is what we normally associate with mayors of like say Northeastern older cities where the mayor is the chief executive. You effectively don't elect a policy maker, you, you basically you elect an executive. Department heads tend to report directly to the mayor. They will usually have some sort of professional deputy um, mayor. The County of Miami-Dade has a similar uh, system to this, but uh, again, we, we decided that of the many different ways that you can change the relationship between the elected body and the professional execution of it, what we have is working. Um, and we did not want to make any changes to that. But those two things we did discuss at length uh, and just wanted to address that because the fact that they're not here doesn't mean that they're not important. It just meant that while we only had so much time to make recommendations that could potentially meet the deadline to have some of these on the ballot in November, we wanted to make those recommendations to the commission and let them basically use their discretion to figure out what, on, what they would like to or not uh, put on the ballot for a public referendum. So moving on to the first of these, the qualification members, uh, forfeiture of office uh, 303. Uh, so next slide, please. So we recommended that this needs to clarify that candidates for uh, both the mayor and city commission have to have one, resided in the city continuously as permanent residents for at least six months for uh, proceeding the qualification of office. This seems kind of self-explanatory. Uh, I will say that there was an extensive conversation that can only happen when you have too many lawyers at a table about <laughs> a permanent resident uh, versus resident. But there was the understanding that permanent residence does reflect a level of seriousness and investment in the community that we actually do want to see uh, in both our electives and the city manager. Two, the electors of the city, which basically means registered to vote, at the time of qualification, uh, the current charter basically just says you have to be 21 years of age. We think you should be registered to vote too. Yes. Um, yeah, that's good. Then three, not hold any other elective office or be an officer or employee of the city at the time of filing their candidate of oath of office in accordance with the section. In fact, this actually came into play, uh, former Commissioner Ben Sorensen was one of the Charter Revision Board members, and when he filed to run for office again, uh, he had to resign his appointed post on this board because we kind of understand that if you are running for office, that is a sacred trust. You need to focus on that. You cannot have dual loyalties or split your time more than that. So that is the first set of recommendations that we've made based on this section alone. So you can go to the next slide. This basically is just a bit of a qualifier in what I just said. And the one thing that's kind of important on this slide is that we wanted to make sure that there was language in the charter that addressed reapportionment, reprecinting, redistricting, uh, what ends up happening usually in the year ending in a two after the new census ending in a zero, where the new counts of the city population are going to result in different districts. I live in Sailboat Bend. Uh, in 2012, I voted in District 4 for City Commission. Uh, I lived in the same precinct that I lived back then and lived quite a few places in between, just sailboat bend. And I am in District 2. And one of the things that we realized that we needed to make sure was clear in here is if you live in your home and you have been invested in the city and by no fault of your own, the people who uh, designed the precinct maps decide that, okay, your neighborhood is now in your neighboring district. Well, that shouldn't disqualify you from running in that district. And we really decided that the, the language that's currently there is a little too strict insofar as the fact that it says that you have to have resided in that district for six months prior to run. Well, again, if your house changed district and you didn't move, you should be entitled to run in the district that you currently live. Uh, we felt like that was a nice little cleanup of something that might not happen often, but is not so far outside the realm of possibility that it should be accounted for in the document. Uh, next slide, please. Judge of elections and qualification of members. So the charter really refers to the city clerk uh, as the, the final officer uh, adjudicating elections. 
And in practice, that is just not what happens. Uh, the canvassing board, which is made up of a supervisor of elections, member of the county commission, and a judge, have the final say in basically totaling the votes and saying who won which election. And they have uh, rules in place for what happens if it's within 1%, you have to go to the hand recount. It's not quite 1%, you have to go to manual recount. Um, and what happens again, if, if there are lawsuits in between where the judicial body has to wind up creating some sort of judgment that says when an election is over. Fundamentally though, it does not come back to the city clerk's office to have that role. And we kind of thought that this is no longer something that should be in the charter, we should reflect the uh, reality that it is the canvassing board that has that responsibility. Uh, next slide. Designation of vice mayor. We made a couple of changes here, uh, most of which dealt with uh, an issue that, that happened when your last new commissioners uh, were seated. Um, I work for the county commission, that's my day job, doesn't have anything to do with what I do with the charter revision board. But I know that we tend to uh, elect the mayor and vice mayor because we have a rotating mayor and vice mayorship um, after the new electeds are sworn in. Why is this important? Well, if two, three members of your elected body are about to no longer be on that elected body, well, you shouldn't be choosing the vice mayor and the people that are there on the dais before the new folks are sworn in. Seems pretty non-controversial, um, but I do think that that was something that we really believe should be in the charter just for clarification purposes. Uh, next slide, please. Forfeiture of office. This was basically also reflecting a reality, uh, which is that it's not for the commission itself to police whether or not its members are qualified for office. Uh, there are plenty of things in statute that basically say that the governor has a sole authority if somebody commits crime is arrested, that they can be suspended from office or removed uh, once they are convicted. And we wanted to, once again, reflect the fact that the charter language should be what the current practice is in existence, because again, this was something that was written probably before that was a matter of state law. But now that it is, it's weird to have language both in the charter and also again it, it suggests a self-policing function of the electives that I, I don't think is a great matter of public policy. Next slide. The organization meeting, this ties back to what I was saying before about the uh, selection of vice mayor. Um, the organizational meeting, it needs to again, it, there needs to be a time and place where that actually is the meeting in which you do have a new election of vice mayor as well as the swearing in of any newly elected members of the board. There are two conflicting charter provisions currently, and we really wanted to make sure that this was uh, prescribed as one policy that could basically apply universally from here on out. And what that is, is we want that organizational meeting to take place 14, within 14 days of the certification of the election by the canvassing board, uh, which again, Normally it is. It's usually you know, the, we're having the election on the first Tuesday of the month and it's on the third. So in the 14 days, everything's kosher. But we also, again, want the language to be in there that all new members have to be seated before that reorganization actually takes place. And that at the regular meeting, that is when the reorganization will be taking place. Next slide. A special meeting to seat a new member. We're recommending that this section come out because if we are making the changes that we suggested to uh, 3.09, this is the kind of superfluous uh, old statute, or not statute, old charter language that no longer applies and therefore should just be eliminated so that there is some confusion as to which of the two sections have primacy. Uh, moving on to the next section. So the meeting place and meetings to be available to the public. Um, in accordance with current practice, we want to make sure that the charter says that the meetings are supposed to be the first and third Tuesday of the month, every month, with the exception that they are allowed to take a month off of vacations, and by ordinance, create a schedule where if a Tuesday happens to be a holiday or some other day that the meeting is not ideally going to be taking place on, they can move it to the Wednesday thereafter. 
but that this has to be advertised, that these communities have to be open to the public. There is language in there about the fact that the meetings are supposed to take place at City Hall. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think I need to expand upon that. <laughs> but again, we figured that it was better to have this language tightened up just to reflect both current practice and also not to create some potential conflict in the future. Um, but otherwise, again, I, I think that our changes to this were fairly modest. Uh, next slide, please. Initiative. This actually was one of the longer discussions we had, and I think we came up with something that um, is a little bit novel, but is more inclusive of the same 10 people that are always part of the process, but not necessarily on, on the elected body. That there needs to be a little bit more of a streamlining about what it requires when you as a group of <laughs> engaged citizens want to petition the city commission to take action and they say no. So we decided that an initiative form needs to basically be standardized and created by the city attorney's office and available at the city clerk's office. So that you can say, I want to suggest the following ordinance change of the body and I and my committee of 10 people are gonna go out and collect petitions. Mm -hmm. So we decided that instead of using the uh, strict number of 1,000, uh, we came to the conclusion that it should be 1% of the registered voters of the city, which right now, I think that would be about 1,300. But we figured again, it might scale with the population, but we're basically keeping that 1,000 number as our baseline while still trying to make this accessible. The issue that we didn't want to have is to see a group go out and collect a thousand plus petitions only to be told that the thing you are collecting the petitions for is not something that the city attorney's office or anyone else says that the city can you know, entertain. That is both a waste of your time and energy that is also really unfair to the idea of why you should be engaged this much in the process. So it should be the case that the city attorney should be able to tell you before you get your petition forms themselves, well, is the thing that you are asking people to sign for, is this something that we can bring to the city commission? And they make these changes. And again, if, if the answer is no, at least you get that no at the outset and not after you put in untold tens, if not hundreds of hours of work into something that, that frankly, again, should be considered a little bit more sacrosanct. The second part of it is that if you collect the sufficient number of petitions and still the city commission decides to, of their infinite wisdom, not take that up under consideration, um, there is language in the charter that basically compels a referendum of the public. And that way we can make sure that if people are going through this process, to demand something of their elected body that they. Where is that section? Where is uh, the related section that, that says that? 3.15. 3 yeah. There are copies here on the table. Thank you. And it has the, the strike through language, which can be a little dense uh, at times. And I, I apologize. Uh, Paul Begal from the city attorney's office has been very generous in, in trying to make this as readable as possible. But uh, again, some of these things were uh, Thank you. decided by committee with a lot of lawyers in the room arguing on technicalities. And I, again, I, I think we came to some good conclusions, but this one was something that uh, the vice chair, Chris Furtick, felt very strongly about. And, and frankly, again, I, I know that there is past experience where committees of citizens did try to use the petition effort to get action taken by the commission and felt that there were loopholes in the charter that were exploited to ignore the effort uh, while still doing so in a way that was within the language of the existing charter. This, I think, again, streamlines the process to correct some of those things while also not making it 
such a low barrier that you know five people with petitions can harass the commission to do things that they're not going to do. Can I can I make a suggestion for your presentation? Yes, please. In parentheses on the bottom of that, at the last, if you get to five in parentheses, or right. cite the section. Oh, it's it's at the top. Oh, it's coming out to the next one. I'm sorry, because that's so so important. No, no, so it, it, it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so we can move on to the next slide, and I'm going to take questions. Uh, so uh, I think I covered most of these, but I'll just uh, get a few points as well. Same section, uh, same effort. That the signed petitions are going to be submitted to the supervisor of elections for verification, as opposed to the city clerk. Supervisor of elections already does this function when people want to qualify for office by petition. It is the supervisor's office that verifies the signature and that people are electors within the city or wherever they are filing to run. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that that was consistent. Upon receipt of certificate issued by the supervisor of elections that the petition is sufficient, the city commission has to sit, consider the petition. If the city commission fails to adopt the proposed initiative ordinance without any change in substance, within 45 days, fails to repeal the referred ordinance in 30 days, should submit the proposed or referred ordinance to the electors of the city. Uh, so basically, this is what I was saying before, that if the petition process is successful and the sufficient number of petitions are verified by the supervisor of elections, handed over to the city commission, and they do not take the prescribed action, charter language then mandates that there was a referendum on that. That way, again, people who are going through that process have the ability to make sure that their work is considered. Just, sure. just, uh, just another question. Sure. The prescribed action. Is the prescribed action holding a hearing and voting yes or no? Or is the prescribed action voting yes? The prescribed action is, uh, well, we made this broad enough to say whatever the petition itself, like the language of the So petition. if the petition is, I want to change the ordinance thus and such, and they hold a hearing, yeah. and they say no, We've considered it. We held a public hearing. That was the prescribed action, and we said no. I believe from the language that we are suggesting in that circumstance, it would have to go to referendum. Okay. And if it's not airtight like that, um, I've got one more meeting, but uh, you can certainly speak to the next district two representative. But, uh, I've got receiving well, events. Put it in that same area. Is there a necessity at any time to have a one percent of a district? We thought about that, but ultimately decided um, it really did. And, and this actually, it's my second time on Charter Review. Uh, when I previously looked in Hollywood, I got a print into Charter Review. I don't know what's wrong lucky, with me. They, they just keep throwing yeah. it. <laughs> but we actually did in the Hollywood Charter uh, changes we made, wanted to make sure that of the um, six, dis yeah, six districts, plus one mayor's name, uh, that exists in Hollywood, that there needed to be an even number of signatures across the districts. I never really liked that as a requirement because I think if you're finding a thousand plus people who are registered to vote, who are willing to sign their name to something, um, and potentially it is of disproportionate significance to say each. Okay then I, I don't think that it, it should be incumbent upon a group of volunteers to go across the city beyond hitting that number of verified petitions to begin with. I think it's just a high enough bar that I, I know where you're going with that, but I just, I just don't know that it always makes as much sense and it's not just a logistical difficulty that makes it harder and harder to even just meet that threshold to begin with. But again, it, it was it was brought up as a consideration. Any other questions on? Oh, sorry. No, I, had a, I had a question. Um, if you want to do the petition process, people need to realize though there are fees involved with that. Doesn't the supervisor charge a fee? I believe it's ten cents per per, uh, per signature verification. So let's say again, you, you want to get to thirteen. I wish I knew this number off the top of my head, but again. So let's just say 1,300 signatures. Um, more often than not, that you're going to at least get in full range of about like 1,500 before you bring them in for verification because somebody's going to have moved, somebody's not registered, somebody doesn't actually live in Fort Lauderdale, they say it's Fort Lauderdale, but no, that's temptation. Uh, you should know the difference. 
these things happen. Um, but that being said, the, the 10 cents for, um, for verification, it, there is also a, a mechanism here where the committee that is doing the petition gathering is able to raise some funds. And we, we thought that those prices were, were fair because it does take staff time to go in and verify this. Um, and there wasn't really much acknowledgement of that in the system charter language. But no, that is a fair point. It, 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 there would be costs in the um, and then just to, to read off those last two points, I just so I'm not leaving anything out. The vote of the electorate is held in conjunction with the city's next regular municipal election, unless the committee elects an earlier vote of the electorate, either in conjunction with the earlier available Broward County election or a mail ballot election, provided that the committee shall prepay costs uh, at, of the vote of the electorate that is held earlier than the city's next regular municipal election. That sounds incredibly dense, but I'm gonna explain why the language says what it says. This came back to one of those big issues where we saw a problem, but didn't feel like we had the ability to use the charter to change that. And that was, do we have our elections in November or do we put the primacy on having primaries or runoffs and therefore have to move them back to March? The city's regular municipal elections, uh, unless it does get changed by later revisions to the charter, will be quadrennial elections in November. And if you, the committee, would like to have a public re referendum on that, it will then be on the ballot that next November, uh, where, where, again, the city is coming out to vote. The exception really is that the supervisor of elections, and, and Joe Scott spent a lot of time with us, and I've got to give him a lot of credit for uh, coming to multiple meetings and saying that as a matter of policy, his office has decided that they are not really willing to uh, basically put in the cost of real estate and staff time to have off cycle uh, special elections anymore. However, uh, because it would be fair to say universally know that. If somebody wants to pay the cost to mail every elector in, in this case, the city of Fort Lauderdale, a uh, vote by mail ballot, they can do so. <laughs> I think the cost for that, based on the number of voters that we have, is something on the order of $200,000. Um, I could be slightly off, but yeah, ballpark it's between. It's a lot. It, it's yeah. a considerable amount, but again, it, it, if if this is something that a committee finds urgent and is willing to pay the cost, they can say, we are going to prepay the cost and every single person at Fort Lauderdale is going to get a mail-in ballot with just one referendum question, this thing that was on our petition, yes or no. In which case, again, the election will have a deadline, but there is no additional cost of opening up polling places, early voting sites, um, or, or having any other kind of collection ballots. So it would just be done. That. And that I thought was a, a, a fair way of accommodating the fact that sometimes there are going to be things that you don't want to wait until the next four year election cycle to come up. And then the other option there being that, um, so Broward still has elections pretty much every March, but in March, even though they are not the Fort Lauderdale municipal cycle elections anymore. Uh, cities of like Coconut Creek, Lardo by the Sea, Hillsboro, uh, Mile, uh, Pepper Pines, uh, and a handful of others still have that March cycle election, which also usually coincides on five years. But five or six cities? Something like that. I don't yeah, that, It's answer. very odd. It's very odd. Yeah. Most of them have moved to November. November, correct. Not all. Okay. Because it saves, it saves the county and the taxpayers a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Lauderdale by the Sea. Yeah. And yeah, like the, the, the last two larger ones are, are Pembroke Pines and, and Coconut Creek. Um, and again, no, no disrespect to the other smaller municipalities, but just I don't know when Sea Ranch Lakes has, has its elections. I don't know places that have some election. Um, but more importantly, there is that, that option of in March, well, our supervisor is conducting an election. And you can either elect to do that or during the November primary, uh, sorry, sorry, the August primary, there were again, still elections where voting sites are open and all of that staff costs can really be baked in. So 
the committee would have the opportunity to elect to do that, provided that whatever the additional costs were to the city were being prepaid by the committee, not being passed into the taxpayer. Uh, I know this sounds like it's very deep in the weeds, but we were trying to come up with the most fair, yet accessible process possible, given what the current restrictions are, both at the supervisor of elections level and also making sure that, again, this is not something that's going to be abused to just pass on costs and annoyance to the taxpayer, because, say, somebody just wants to make sure that a block paper gets wasted doing something that he's never going to be elected to do by the city. Uh, the last one, uh, 10, if the majority of qualified electors voting on a proposed initiative or uh, initiative ordinance or on a referred ordinance, the difference being that initiative ordinance is something that's proposed to be done that is not currently done. Referred ordinance is, again, like a recall. You are telling them to void an existing ordinance. Uh, a vote in favor of the measure is considered adopted upon certification of the election results. And once again, this is uh, the five of us kind of veterans of election cycles. And while well, this part probably hasn't happened in the city as much, we do know at the state level, we've passed quite a few constitutional amendments and then it goes to the legislature to interpret. Um, and frankly, we didn't think that that was fair to the, the citizens that are doing the initiative. We think that if the electorate <clears throat> passes your initiative or referendum to recall an ordinance, that is now the law, as if it was passed by the city commission, second public hearing signed. And again, no, no room for interpretation. We wanted to make sure that that was as reflective as possible of the wishes of the committee. And we just have a few more sections, so I'm gonna go through them quickly. The city manager appointment qualifications compensation. The only change here, and this is a measure of what we did for the electeds, is that the city manager has to be a permanent resident of the city during uh, her or his term in office. The reason, I was on the not the prevailing side of this vote, but I did understand the, the rationale here. And the thing that really did sway my opinion after the fact was the idea that in a state of emergency, uh, you want your city manager who is basically going to uh, assume some emergency powers uh, to be living here and not anywhere outside the city boundaries. And frankly, it, it, the, the board voted that that was the recommendation, and I do understand the logic, but that was the discussion that we did. Um, next section. Okay, so this in section eight uh, covers a couple of different uh, sales of property, and we decided to handle all of them, but there is more emphasis placed on uh, public land, and clearly we'll, we're going to get to them. But in section one, uh, 801, so the sale of uh, what's considered a personal property. We don't think that the charter should really um, dictate the minimum amount before which you have to go to a bid purpose. This could really be done by ordinance. Um, the existing language is also probably a little outdated because the amounts of money that are cited, I can't even necessarily tell you how long ago they were put into the charter but to have to come back and update this on a recurring basis seemed unnecessary. And uh, Richard Weiss, who's on the Charter Revision Board, uh, his firm is basically the um, city attorney for multiple cities, mostly in Dade. They also have Miramar and Weston, and at least one other here in Broward. Um, they said that overwhelmingly, these kinds of sections are no longer uh, prescribed to charter language. This really can better be done as ordinance, and therefore can be kept up to date and in accordance with what the, the public body demands. The next section, the sale of public lands and public property to public bodies. This one was also important because, uh, again, one of the things that I do at the county is we look at, at untold numbers of small different uh, exchanges of parcels that are usually referred to as uh, not being suitable for development. This is what ends up happening when there's an easement taken by FDOT and a small 
tenth of an acre is left over and has to be escheated back to the city or the county. Technically, this is conveyance of land, but overwhelmingly, when it is done government entity to government entity, uh, this is being done for a public purpose, and usually these are de minimis amounts of property. And so we wanted to make sure that while we did have real concerns about protecting the public access to land in perpetuity, we didn't want to create some unnecessary barrier to these like ministerial items that come before the commission on a routine basis and are usually passed on consent because again, we're not talking about land that you can build on. It's, you know, a quarter strip of sidewalk that used to belong to the South Florida Water Management District and that belongs to the city or vice versa. Um, but again, all of that has to be done for a paramount public use. Uh, the word paramount was, was suggested again by Richard. Um, what a paramount public purpose is, it can be a matter for debate, but there is case law surrounding that. And we decided that if that is the, the term of art that really the courts will recognize, then we're satisfied that that's a, a good enough threshold without, again, creating a, an unnecessary barrier. Uh, next slide. Sale of real property to private persons, firms, or corporations. This is where the board really did have uh, something that we wanted to make sure was in was put into the charter as a higher standard than what currently exists. Board recommends amending section 8.04 to provide that the city's sale real property to a private property uh, private parties uh, be as provided by the ordinance consistent with applicable law and subject to adoption of a resolution and affirmative vote of at least four commissioners. That was God saying that's a good idea. <laughs> well, the, the one vote that counts. Um, and we really did go back and forth on trying to figure out what the right threshold was. Did we want this to be a unanimous vote? Um, what other considerations had to be there? And we really came back to the idea that a supermajority vote really is the best reasonable accommodation that we can make that public land is not being disposed of capriciously. Um, I don't have to opine on the facts of why that needed to be in the charter, but we really felt that needed to be in the charter. Uh, next section. Leases for more than one year and not for more than 50 years. <clears throat> Combined with what we just said about this last section about public property, we decided that we wanted to clean up the ambiguity surrounding leases and licensing agreements. Because currently the charter does say that you can only have a 50 year lease of public property to a non-public entity. Uh, I'm not going to go over the history of how that <laughs> restriction has been addressed, but not necessarily in the spirit of the charter language. And so we decided that we wanted to just make this a lot more explicit and say that 50 years means 50 years. You can't stack uh, a lease now and a lease later uh, in one vote. You can have some sort of staggered agreement that does have renewal periods that have to come back to the commission. For approval or again agreement with the uh, with MLC. But we wanted to make sure that given that the charter, the current charter language doesn't allow the city to enter into 99 year leases or really anything about 50, that 50 means 50 and a lease is the same as a licensing agreement, is the same as any permanent use of land where the city maintains title but not paramount use. And frankly, again, I, I think that we were considering a lot of possibilities there and this was probably one of the lengthier conversations we had on the single topic but i think we really did come to a level of consensus to say there were considerations that we might not be thinking of at the moment but we want what's currently there in spirit to be as explicit as possible so that the city is bound by this as seeing that that is fundamentally the purpose of your charter document it is the constitution of the city and therefore, this is the paramount. Um, and that is the recommendation that we're making to the commission. Is there 
Oh, this is again, I just continue to the same, um, the same item. In addition to requirement of fair market value analysis, this was one of the other requirements that we had in there. We want to make sure that if land is being tied up for that 50 year period, that if this is basically a real estate transaction, that there is a fair appraisal at the county level, uh, we require three appraisals before we dispose of property of different size. Um, and if there is a business that is coming in to use the land, but not necessarily take ownership of it, that there is an outside audit from a consultant, uh, you know, approved by the city commission well in advance that says the business plan is sound and therefore the proposed return on investment to the city can be taken at face value. Not going to go into past history. Everyone is aware of it. Um, section 8.21. This again it, it is where we really went to the highest uh, degree of wanting to protect public access to public land, and that is land that's made in park use. Um, obviously, uh, parks should be parks and should be open to the public. And really, that there, there was no disagreement about that. Um, one of the things that we decided to put into the charter. And this wasn't always true in the past, but the city manager's office is doing a yeoman's job uh, of making sure that all parks are now going to be zoned parks. There are a couple of parcels that are outstanding, but, but that process should be completed relatively soon. And the city cannot dispose of land, zone parks, recreation, open space, except as may be approved in a referendum at a special election special election here referring to what I was just saying about how we're basically standardizing our elections to the quadrennial in November. However, there is always that August primary that can be piggybacked on or on a mark site if it's there, plus also the availability of the prepaid mail. Um, but this one we don't know about the city, so that's my point. That the city not lease land zone parks recreation open space except pursuant to a unanimous vote of the entire city commission, where we were willing to go for a super majority uh, with other public lands, parks, unanimous vote. That's that's what's required. Uh, lease, why didn't you include lease license? La 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 la. I think that's the next. It's the next one? I think so. Okay. Um, Oh, yes, sorry, it's this, this slide piece makes up the next one. Um, that, oh, right, yeah, there, there is uh, in that section right now a reference to November 10, 2004, as one of the last times that there was an effort to make sure that all of the parks land was zoned parks. Uh, frankly, that's, that's no longer really relevant. Uh, it should, if it's zoned parked, yeah, sorry, if it is zoned parks, recreation, and open space um, at present, then it is covered by this. It really shouldn't be retroactive to uh, previous tenure of the, the city. Um, all right, and again, just uh, reiterating that it's an anonymous vote that's going to be required. So on the, the next slide, this. Well, I know that we definitely said, maybe it's just there in the strikeout version. Uh, if you can just go back one, I, I thought it was going to be you know, my apologies. But I, I know that we, we parallel the language to basically say that a lease is equivalent to a license agreement is equivalent to all of these other mechanisms. There actually was a kind of exhaustive list that Paul was able to generate. Um, and I think what we settled on fundamentally was use agreement. Um, and again, it was just because that was the broadest umbrella term that we can come up with that covered any way that an outside entity could have more or less permanent use of public land. Okay. So yeah, we, we, uh, I, I hear what you're saying. And again, mm -hmm. we, we did consider that and and yeah, president put on the slide, but it is, okay. it is there. Got it. Yeah. It's very tight. Yeah. It um, if, if you do pick I this up, uh, the last page, when it's at the 14, has this uh, written, in, I'd say plain English, but you know, too many lawyers touched it. Um, so if you could go on to the next slide, I think it is just the next steps. Unfortunately, uh, 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 next week on Tuesday, when the, the, the board is going to be meeting with the commission, uh, I have my county commission okay. meeting and can't attend, which 
grinds my gears. <laughs> but it really yeah. was the the best time for everybody to work together. And the idea from both the chair, the vice chair, and you know the other members of the board is that the charter revision board wanted to make sure that some of these very high level important items where we saw deficiencies in the existing language were going to be addressed in such a way that the public might still have an opportunity to vote on them and adopt them permanently this November. However, that doesn't mean that the work of the board is um, And there really was a, a lot of uh, discussion about the fact that the board really does, that, again, we meet the first Thursday of the month at the executive airport, but there is a real desire to make sure that uh, we are, I say we, it's Michael and my current uh, other board members will be out in the community more and really soliciting feedback on all of those sections of charter that either we didn't get a chance to discuss or where we similarly came up with issues that we'd like to see addressed but are just hamstrung by the strictures of state law recognizing that while the charter should be the supreme law of the land and the city and preemption state and so anything that is adopted by the city commission to go onto the ballot will uh, have to be done by June 10th, uh, which again is why we wanted to make sure that these recommendations were being conveyed now. And whatever the city commission does choose to adopt would be then on your ballot in November for consideration. And I'd be happy to come back and discuss this more at we would. <laughs> I will promise, is when it, unless it goes through some of this, there will be clip notes. Okay. Yeah. You guys all know what that is. So. Mm -hmm. All right. I see Barbie. We're going to take a very few questions. Okay. Go ahead. I know there's a big debate on lease versus license. Mm -hmm. Is there a clarification on all of that? So we decided that any use agreement needed to be treated the same as a lease. The existing charter language says that the city is limited to doing a 50 year lease and a project that need not be named um, was attempting to circumvent this by basically having a license agreement for longer than 15 years. We said that we are treating all use agreements as equivalent to leases. You can't get around this by saying that it's not a lease, it's something else that just looks like a lease. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. A lease, a license, a use agreement have to be treated equally 50 years to 50 years. Yeah, okay. We're just gonna take one more question. Just one more, okay? Um, great presentation. Listen, um, I That's thought a, there have been some discussions about um, uh, lobbyists serving on advisory boards. And I there was some chatter in the city about that. Where where did that end up? Um, so that actually I don't think there's something explicitly in the. I don't. I don't think that came in the mm -hmm. charter revision board. Did it? We did. We did discuss it, it but it did, yes. oh, but free. And and well, Paul kind of came back with the fact that there's there there's a difference of opinion as to like whether or not somebody is serving as an officer in their capacity as an advisory board member, and that the charter revision board because we don't have final jurist like we can't put something directly on the ballot. We can only give it to mm -hmm. the commission as literally an advisory board that none of us are officers of the city. So that's, it is a point well taken, I'm not saying I disagree, but the city attorney opined and we decided to move on from debating that. Okay. All right, thank you. There was no case All right. just Thank you very much. And Anthony. And you know, Jim and I and a couple of you, we 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 sat through a lot of these meetings, and you think this is a lot. It should be, a, <laughs> and you can watch them in your leisure time on YouTube. If you are a glutton for punishment, yeah, that can be uh, really something. So I think we can get through. Um, so that oh, I'm sorry. We do have an unexpected visitor, uh, Commissioner Sturman. He's just going to talk very briefly. Yeah, very briefly, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, by the way, thank you for your work. Number two, uh, 
Mary, you guys, I remember years ago when I was president of Rio Vista, this was a great body. You did a lot of work. The stuff that you deal with here always comes back to my desk on the city commission. It's very valuable. You hone in on the issues that we need to deal with and all the problems in the city. A charter review is a huge thing. We had a weird thing that came through where we had to, according to the charter, um, the, the, the city commission had to accept the new members after it was already certified. And in order to accept the new members, we had to have a quorum. To have a quorum, we needed three people, and the three people had already left. So we couldn't have a quorum to accept the people to make a quorum. There was no catch to me, too. A lot of those things were cleaned up. I'm going to talk about something very brief, something totally different. Um, homeless is a big problem going on now. As everybody knows, the state of Florida just signed a new law that uh, uh, outlawed camping and homelessness on the streets, uh, camping in public places such as on in parks, in, uh, by, you know, by place of worship in residential areas. Uh, there's a problem that we keep, we've discussed a couple of times in the city commission. Um, I've uh, uh, spoken to staff taking the lead on some of the issues with this. Um, it's, it's, quote, illegal, but there's no place to take some of these people. We have some shelters. There's somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,500 to maybe 8,000 people living on the streets, depending on whether you're doing a, uh, an estimate or a point in time. This in between 600 and quarter and 712, the number picked by year varies, beds, shelter beds. So you see there's not enough beds to accommodate everybody that is on the streets. The problem that we have <laughs> is that according to the new law, um, we uh, are obligated if there's a, a um, complaint made, the city has to remove a homeless person that is uh, in front of a business or in front of a home or in front of a park. And if not, we can be sued at this particular point. We could be sued by the person and it may be the city per se. Uh, the flip side is we've had two lawsuits since we've been here. One, uh, somebody that, you know, the feeling of Mr. Abbott, as you know about that, was very famous. And there was another one when we had another ordinance about not being in the streets for the safety of, of, of uh, the person that was handling. And the uh, issue is, um, uh, we lost both of those on First Amendment rights. And even though the plaintiff might have gotten $10,000, the attorney fees were hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. So the city's in a bind. On the one hand, after October 1st, uh, we, you know, if we get a complaint, we have to respond. If we don't respond, we could be sued. Number two, if we do respond, we could be sued by the person. That would, because by law, we cannot. It's not, it wasn't illegal to be homeless in the past. So now... The question is, and it was proposed maybe that we should go ahead and arrest everybody that's homeless so we don't get sued, and that's there's not enough beds in the jail. Um, the two, a couple terms, one, a county does not have what's called a low barrier shelter. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of shelter beds, but there's a couple, well, there's three classes of, of homeless, there's the easy ones, the one who rapid rehousing, those are people who've lost their job, who have uh, no an illness that, that caused them to have some financial issues that uh, are motivated. Then you have the other ones, there's people that have mental illness, drug abuse, alcohol, and then you have criminals, including people that might have a uh, risk of sex offenders. Most of the shelters will not accept people that either have a criminal record, uh, sex offenders, or people that do not want to have a drug tested. Now, the problem you have is if you remove everybody that can go to a shelter, you're left by default with nothing but criminals and drug addicts on the street because they do exist. The question is, what do you do with them? So um, I was tasked about six months ago to work with Broward Health, who's very motivated to solve this problem because we have patients that are in the hospital. So when they're ready to go home, uh, they might have an open wound or antibiotic. I promise, a minute and a half, not be done. They may have an open wound and antibiotic, and they don't need to be in the hospital just to have that wound changed every day and they're taking up the bed. And if sometimes you go to the hospital, you are, there's no room, there's no room in the in, so to speak. Um, so so what we do need to have a low barrier shelter. We need to take care of the people with like a safety net. And one of the proposals was repurposing the stockade. That's been talked about for years. Um, I started to build a coalition, Broward Health is on board for what we're doing. I spoke to a few county commissioners on board. We're, we're expanding this. I have three school board members want to be part of this. The marine community I've spoken to, business community. We're going to be going ahead um, tomorrow. I'm going to be speaking with staff, Anthony, and our attorney to, to start to interpret this. We're going to be expanding our support, whether it be a uh, intake center, uh, 
with its services, whether it be in a, a medical facility or a place that is more housed. Um, we have to deal with people that are both barren in order to comply by the law and to uh, give these people the services they need. The question I'm going to have for you, multiple questions, I do want, if the, if the council wants to take a stand on a low barrier shelter or a repurposing uh, the stockade, I'd like to get your feedback on that. The city as a whole has, uh, in resolution, supported the idea of repurposing the stockade. It's had come up several times, over and over again, we've, already, mm -hmm. we've done it and officially have taken a stand, but the more support I can get for doing something of this nature, the better it will be. Thanks. I, I thought the law said that this has to move me annually, that it's only for a year, that has to go someplace mm -hmm. else. I mean, the people that, well, as of October, as of October, we have to, we could start getting sued on a regular basis. Uh, the, uh, every time somebody calls that says, listen, we're not, we're not removing a homeless person in front of their place of business, each one of these people can sue the city. We have to have some place to take them. Legally, we can't take, we can't remove them. It's a, it's a right, right. But what I'm saying, the shelter could only be it for one well, year. The, 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 from the, the, from the way I do. Okay. I, the the particulars of we can work the particulars out on a later date. I just want to open it up for discussion. Mary will take it to the next. Right, well, we're, we're we're gonna, gonna, this is agenda Mary. item, Mary. This no, we're not sorry, gonna 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 talk, but I just wanted to say thank this you. This is Mary. a huge issue, and we yeah, have well, to thank our governor and our representatives in this, Tallahassee this, for forcing this on us. Right, Jim. It's it's late. It's late. So take in what he's saying. It might be something we discuss at the next meeting. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. It might yes. be something. But uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you so much. Guys. Appreciate everybody thinking about this. Okay. So, well, see, people are leaving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand that. Okay. Quickly, take a look at the agenda um, under Council Business. Any nominations for our reporting secretary? Okay, I don't see any. So what this means is Mary's going to put names in a hat and I'm going to pull them. May I make a suggestion? Yeah. I just bought an, a, a technology, a piece of technology called a plout. Have a you what? ever heard? A plout. Ouch. It's a plout, P-L-A-U-D. It's a recording device. You put it on your phone. Put it on the phone. It costs 150 bucks. You put the phone on the table. You hit record. <laughs> It records everything. Well, wait, 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 wait. No, no, it records. And then after it transcribes it and gives you a transcription, it uses AI mm -hmm. to give you a summary of the meeting. Okay. Spell that thing again? P-L-A-U-D. And it puts it in language, people language. It, okay. it, it organizes it. It says what, what the resolutions oh, okay. were, who said what, you know? So you might want to, in an interim, huh. as an interim thing. Yeah, because it's poor a, Dennis. Yeah. No, Dennis, <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it to the next meeting. I'll give right, it to you and I'll it. send it to you. I'm yeah. look into it. Just yeah. as an interim. Because it's not a, it's it's not right. a popular job, job, so yeah, Mary? I can look into it. So thank you for telling me about that. Yeah. Mary, I'd like, Jim, I'm going to nominate your name as recording secretary. Would you like to take it? I don't think he wants to do it. He's already, like, overloaded with stuff. So. Okay. Thank you. I know, because I tried I to do something else. Good <laughs> Good try. Good try. <laughs> His job, <laughs> that job, and he would be so good, but he's doing other things. Um, but thank you, Marilyn. Yeah. And we might have somebody, I just don't know for sure. The sponsorship program is alive. You can go on and be a sponsor. We haven't marketed it yet. I need to sit down with my man, Michael. We need to go over it. Susie Bernstein, I who I was on Zoom, came up with a, a really good looking page. I just haven't had a chance to really look at it and look at the information on it. We're going to start marketing it. Um, I'm I'm going to be a sponsor, so I'll probably I'll be the uh, guinea pig, uh, the first guinea pig, just to see how well it works. I meant to do that before this meeting, but it didn't happen. So go ahead and take a look at the website. It's out there, and um, you know I don't think it's going to be too hard. And if you know anybody that's interested, yes, Michael, uh, let me know. I, I like just like this. You just mentioned a name, and I like to give her kudos because this Susie. meeting is being reported. It's the Susie. It, it, if anyone has seen mm -hmm. the uh, latest social media that's being presented mm -hmm. of the council, yeah, mm -hmm. on Instagram, yeah, 
It's Fantastic. terrific. Awesome. Yeah, she's doing. Susie, I hope you can hear us. They are still on. Congratulations. Yeah, but uh, I, I'm watching. Yeah, oh, good. terrific job. And thank I'll, you. I'll talk to you. We appreciate it. All right, I'll talk to you in the next couple of days about what you put together. It looked good. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, and that is actually the next thing I was going to talk about, the Instagram page. Please look at it. It's really super. If you have anything you want to put on it, you can let Susie know or let me know, and I'll let Susie know, okay. all right? But I'm hearing from a lot of people that they really like That's it. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting modern. Okay. <laughs> uh, the next thing are the rules changes for the parks. I think I talked about this a little bit last time. How many of you have seen the rules, pros rules changes? by the uh, Parks, Rec, and Beach Advisory Board. I know you have. You, I think it was on that part, on that thumb drive, the, the rule changes. I just want you to be aware of them because some people don't really get that. You know, one of the big changes is dogs allowed in all city yeah, parks. Right. Really? There are rules that yeah. go along with the dogs being allowed in all yeah, city parks. Park. It's not just free for all of dogs. There are some neighborhoods and some places Marilyn brought one up and a couple other places where they're like, this isn't appropriate for our, our, our park or our neighborhood or, you know, whatever the reason, what I'm going to suggest, and I'm not going to have a chance, there's no parks, uh, there's no parks, rec and beach advisory board meeting before this is a, a proposed to the uh, city commission, is that if a neighborhood doesn't want to have a particular park or parks in their neighborhood, they, I mean, you might not want to, or you might, there might be some, I don't know, I don't know every park, but I know most of them. Um, they can go to their district commissioner and explain why. And I don't know if it should be that the 30 percent of the people who live in the neighborhood don't want dogs in that park, and they can get them, you know, signed up, and we get it verified without it being a huge project. Then fine, no dogs in that park. Like yeah, Vanessa made a very good suggestion about that. Yeah. It's either opt in. I or opt out. I yeah. prefer opt in, not yeah. opt out. Yeah. So I I say I think. So anyway, that's, I just want you guys to be aware of it because it's going to be not the next city commission meeting, but the one after. If you can't tell, proposals. huh? these are just proposals. Yeah. Can you scoot down, scoot it down to where it's, I think it should be red. Yeah. Right there. Okay. Right there. So okay, I can't see it now. Dogs are permitted in parks on a six foot, six foot leash under the control of responsible <laughs> adult. adult. That's kind of a key word. Um, however, it is strictly prohibited to bring dogs or any pets on or into any athletic field, playground, or water splash pad, swimming areas, or any body of water unless permitted by law for service animals. Dogs are only allowed to be off leash in designated bench in dog areas. Dog owners are responsible for cleaning up and disposing of any waste created by their dogs. So, I would like to be able to walk out of the door of my house, walk five minutes to my park and be able to walk my dog. Just like I can walk him in New York, LA, Chicago, Cleveland, and Denver. So that's me, but they're not every park, maybe their neighborhood is like me. So be aware of this. It's going to be brought up. And if you're, you know, have any strong feelings about it, write to the commission or your commissioner. I know that several neighborhoods have done that. Mine just did it. Tarpon River did it, downtown did it. Riverside. And, yeah, Riverside. Several. Yeah. And some have written that they don't want any dogs in their park at all. Yeah. Well, they're talking about putting those in the parks. But I mean, if you look at most dog owners are walking with those on the leash. Yeah. So. Or at least like some of the dogs. Yeah. Well, the garbage can. <laughs> Yeah. All parks have dogs. I know in my park, I know right where they are. And I can guarantee you today, several hundred people in a city walk their dogs in city parks, not knowing they weren't allowed to, yeah. with no rules. So that's my spiel on that. Um, yeah. I think in, what is it, June 18th uh, is the commission, but it's going to conference, right? Not conference. the regular meeting. So right. there's not a vote. On well, that's true. The 18th. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. You're right. It is. When I say the regular meeting. No, I'm just saying. I yeah. mean, it's going to come up in the it, next couple of meetings. It was supposed but to be last week, but it got tabled. Yes. So now it's going to conference. So it's not like we have to make a decision or vote. 
Right. Yeah. I think I mean, be aware of it because I don't really absolutely. Think, yeah. They always know that their dog goes, their dog goes with them. And there's yeah, it's just saying like what dogs all parks, but that's not. I mean when I yeah. when I ask people in other cities, it's friends and stuff. They're like, of course you can walk dogs in the park. Why can't you yeah. there? I go. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. It came up at the cemetery board too because cemeteries are basically classified as parks and yeah. Park, but we have our own rules and regulations that don't permit dogs. All right, that would never occur to me to walk my dog. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually pretty nice. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really scared of cemeteries, but still, it seems wrong. All right, all right, all right. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if Melinda's still on the call. Are you, Melinda? Oh, that that, that can go down now. That that we're done with that. No, I she's not. She I didn't get the uh, report from her on the membership report in time to really look at it. Melinda, there. Yes, there she is. Yeah. Go ahead, Melinda. Okay, Hello. go ahead. Yes, go. Uh, so okay, so treasurer's report. I'm actually driving right now, unfortunately. Um, no, so no, I can't. No, 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 no. Thank you very much. No, no, but no, sorry, I, sorry. I can actually speak though. So I don't have. Um, you guys have the report. Um, it just did the general breakdown between PayPal and Truist. And uh, what I would say, um, and I have this very well from memory, is since the last membership meeting, we've had uh, seven associations uh, renewed by PayPal. We've had an eighth person, uh, eighth association re renewed by check. And so that's a total of eight. So we still have some work to do. I think there's about 22 more that uh, we need to renew. And um, we've had one check cash by Gatman that was for about $229. Okay. All right. Thanks, Melinda. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. Next, the audit committee. Jim, James LeBree and Jim Kincannon. They're right here. And actually, you can put the audit up there. So that's very good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, here we go. So Jim and I are the audit committee. Jim's the chair, I'm the member. And we did this audit uh, by reviewing the Council for Lauderdale Civic Association's truest bank statements and the PayPal account for the period fiscal period of April 1st, 2023 to March 31, 2024 for any transaction corresponding to the council's business. Truest account, the beginning balance of 4-1-2023 was 6,943.33. Total deposits for the year, 1,834.71. Total expenses, 6,313.57. The ending balance of March 31st, 2024 was $2,464.47. Some of the major expense categories, if you're interested, mm -hmm. uh, the web hosting service provider, 981. Our district social events were 2293. Uh, insurance costs $1,004. And media, sound, technical support, 750. So those are like the big ticket items. On the PayPal account, uh, beginning balance of 4-1-2023 was $2,343.67. Credits, which are dues paid in, $1,720.36. Debits or transfer to the truest, uh, $1,597.47. And of that, uh, it's not listed here, but $1,534.71 was from the PayPal account to the truest account. And the ending balance for the year ending 3-31-2024 $2,466.56. We reviewed all of the uh, disbursements, all the transactions, and the receipts for any of the invoices or expenses are on file with the treasurer. And that's our committee report. Okay. Is there any okay. questions about the audit? How about online? Nice hearing then. Do we need a resolution? I make a resolution that we accept the audit report. A motion by, yeah, motion's been made 
by uh, Marilyn, and I need a second. Second. Seconded by Betty. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Good job, yes. gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs> you <laughs> take a quick yeah, break yes. and audit. Yes. You can see why we need uh, sponsors. Yes. We need sponsors. And we have two candidate forms coming up. And they're going to cost us a little less money. Um, hopefully even less. Yeah. All right. After that, okay, that's what I just talked about, the candidate form. Okay. We just got the uh, minutes together tonight. I'm none of you have been able to read them. I can imagine. <laughs> why don't we? Why don't we hold Jim, off, Jim and please. Dennis? Until next uh, next meeting to approve the meetings that came out tonight. Yes. Nobody had a chance to look yes. at them, right. so we're going to defer those until then. And your Dennis is seriously taking notes tonight, and uh, yeah. that's the last time. <laughs> All right. Is there any? Any old business? Okay, anything for the good of the community? Yes, Rick. Well, I, I put my hand that out, and I think almost all of you have it from the League of Women Voters yes. that explains yeah. about the uh, amendments that will be on the ballot in um, November. And I thought this might be something that you would want to pass on your community um, so that they can get it. They also, at the top of the uh, handout, is the League of Women Voters site so that they, if you don't want to print them, you could at least give them the website so that they can go and get that information okay. as well. So uh, I'll put that on the Thank you. They're, they're yeah. here. And Kim's going to put on the website. Yeah. Okay. And, is there, and there's a couple of copies here. Is there any... <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, yeah. So I'm here. Um, what was the eight? I just wanted to bring this to your attention. I, I just, so why don't you stand so the camera can see? The brand new book out by the people that are part of the Strong Towns movement. I don't know if any of you know about Strong Towns, but it's like a, a movement to really help revitalize American City. And he's written a book called Escaping the Housing Trap. And it's a comprehensive, I, I just finished reading it, a comprehensive analysis of how we got to the position that we're in today and their solutions for addressing the homeless crisis. So if you like, I mean, I've ordered copies, but I will recommend, and I can give a free book review next month if you like. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see what we have going on, but I would like to see the book. So I, can, yeah, you I can just know, order it online. If you, yeah, if you order it. Okay. If, you, if you want to really understand the situation, I think it's good to be educate yourself. But this right. Is All right. Thank you. I honestly didn't know you were over there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I don't think I really need a motion to end the meeting. I'm just going to say a meeting is over. Oh, that's a jar. <laughs> jar. Thank you. And that is a I really appreciate everybody sticking through that.